My name is Karen Cheeley and I'm the Dean of, the John, of John Carroll's Bowler School of Business and I would like to welcome you to the 60th offering of the Mellon Speaker Series. The Speaker Series is sponsored by the Bowler School of Business's Edward J. and Louise E. Mellon Chair in Finance, established at John Carroll in 1984 through a grant from the Mellon Foundation. Edward and Louise Mellon were lifelong <coughs> residents of Greater Cleveland who shared a commitment to the Cleveland community and its institutions. They believed that their resources came from the community and therefore should return to the community to support its institutions, particularly those related to education and health care. Through the Mellon's generous support, we are able to bring to campus chief executive officers of Ohio headquartered publicly traded companies to discuss the strategic focus of their companies and the challenges they face. The Bowler School strives to provide the best in undergraduate and graduate management education. To this end, our programs combine, in, combine instruction in cutting edge business theory with opportunities for instruction, with opportunities for students to experience firsthand the application of these theories in practice. The Mellon series is an outstanding example of this approach. In addition, the Bowler School recognizes its responsibility as an institution of higher learning to provide opportunities for community lifelong learning, and the Mellon series is a natural vehicle for this purpose. Today we welcome Mike and Michael Elf F. Hilton, President and Chief Executive Officer of Nordson Corporation, as the spring 2015 Mellon series speaker. And now, let me introduce Dr. Bill Elliott, holder of the Edward J. and Louise E. Mellon Chair in Finance, to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here at John Carroll for this past year. It's my first year here at uh, JCU. Um, and having only been here not an entire year, this is our first spring in Ohio. And what I didn't realize about an Ohio spring is that it's not so much a season as it is an acronym. <laughs> and the acronym is Snow Predicted Regularly and Intermittent Nightly Gales. It seems that way. <laughs> Hopefully that's just a one-off this year. But um, for, let, let me get back to the, uh, the main program here. Um, so pro privilege for me to introduce Mr. Michael F. Hilton. He's the President and Chief Executive Officer of Nordson. And uh, Nordson is a leading producer of precision equipment for dispensing adhesives, coatings, and other materials. Uh, since joining Nordson in 2010, Mr. Hilton has uh, led the company to record sales and earnings uh, by deepening the focus <coughs> on innovative new products, uh, em emerging markets, continuous improvement, and strategic acquisitions. Uh, prior to Nordson, Mr. Hilton had a 33-year career at air products and chemicals uh, in a variety of roles of increasing responsibility. Uh, just before leaving air products, he was the senior vice president and general manager with specific responsibilities in the uh, air products, global electronics, and uh, performance materials segment. Uh, he was also responsible for leading the company's environment, health, and safety, and continuous improvement and customer in engagement divisions. Uh, Mr. Hilton serves on the board of directors of Rider System Inc., uh, the board of trustees and the executive council of the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation, the board of Magnet, and the board of Friends of Breakthrough Schools. Uh, he is also a board member of the Nordson Corporation Foundation and is active with the United Way and other uh, charitable endeavors. He's uh, also the 2015-2016 chair of the uh, statewide campaign for the Ohio Federation of Independent uh, University, no, colleges, sorry. Uh, that's an organization to which John Carroll belongs. So Mr. Hilton uh, holds a bachelor's of science in chemical engineering and an MBA from Lehigh. And so without any further delay, I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, th thank you, Bill, for that uh, introduction, and good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to, to be here, and, and tonight we're going to talk a little bit about 
Nordson and really our, a little bit about our approach to uh, strategy, one that we've been employing over the last uh, five years and an overall approach and process that we'll continue to uh, employ going forward. <coughs> now, before I get started, uh, you know, as a uh, publicly traded company, uh, there are uh, things that I might say today that would fall under the safe harbor statement. So if you want to read that quickly, you can uh, read that quickly. Uh, but I thought I'd uh, start off with just a series of uh, uh, questions for you uh, this evening. So I, I presume that you've opened a, a cereal box. Uh, I presume some of these drinks you've enjoyed, and there might be others that you uh, enjoy as well that might uh, have some different content. Uh, and I, I think probably you, you've uh, maybe uh, washed your clothes or mowed the lawn. And some of you have been involved with uh, driving one of these, uh, hopefully not all at the same time. And I would say also you, you probably have uh, a brother or a sister or a niece or a nephew that uh, uses these products. And so if, you, if you're really familiar with, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with these products here, you use them all the time, the smartphones. So if you said yes to any or all of those, then you know a little bit about uh, Nordson. The, the equipment that we manufacture is involved in the production of all of those uh, products. And there's virtually nothing that you touch uh, in your daily life that we haven't had some hand in uh, the manufacture of. Now, uh, about six years ago, uh, I was approached to, to take the job as the CEO of Nordson. And when I first talked to, to my wife about it, she was incredibly excited. And I thought, that's a little surprising because, you know, Nordson's not necessarily a household name. And as things progressed a little bit further and it looked like I was going to go ahead and, and take the job and we had some more discussions about it, uh, I found out why she was so excited. Uh, she thought I was going to take over the job to run Nordstrom. <laughs> <laughs> now, and that's, that's a true story. Now, uh, I'm feeling pretty good, though, actually, that I, uh, that I came to Nordson. So... Uh, hopefully uh, tonight, uh, as we get uh, th through the discussion here, you'll uh, appreciate why I'm so excited to be part of the Nordson organization. A quick overview here. Uh, as Bill said, we're involved in precision dispensing technologies uh, and technologies that are upstream and downstream of that. Now, the company was founded in 1954 by two brothers, Eric and, and Evan Nord. And last year, uh, we ended the fiscal year uh, with $1.7 billion in revenue. We operate uh, in 38 countries. 75% of our business is outside of the U.S. And we employ a little over 6,000 people. Our headquarters are out on the west side in, in Westlake. And I thought I would just uh, play a little video here to give you a little bit of background on the history of Nordson and what we do today. The journey began in 1954, with roots stretching back to 1909. Founded in Amherst, Ohio by Walter G. Nord and his two sons, Eric and Evan, they envisioned their company as a vital, self-renewing worldwide organization which would grow and produce benefits for its customers, shareholders, employees, and communities. Technology and innovation were key to the company's early success. A patent for hot airless paint spraying methods and other coating materials would become the first in a deep portfolio of innovative processes and products that would propel Nordson forward over the next 60 years. The Nords emphasized the importance of being global long before others did. This belief led to the establishment of Nordson bases in Europe, Japan, and Mexico in the 1960s. Australia in the 70s, Brazil in the 80s, China and India in the 90s, and most recently, Russia and South Africa. Today, the philosophies of the Nords still serve as the basis for Nordson's continued success. The company is headquartered in a state-of-the-art green facility located in Westlake, Ohio, and employs approximately 4,000 people in more than 30 countries around the world. With a leadership team committed to growth and continuous improvement, Nordson operates in three global segments, providing value to customers in a wide variety of consumer non-durable, durable, and technology end markets. So if you're listening carefully there, you heard the video say 4,000 people, you heard me say 6,000 people. In the last year and a half, we've added a couple thousand people. Uh, some of them to support our organic growth and quite a few through a number of acquisitions that we've done. 
Uh, and just to, to, to give you a little bit more detail on the, on the company, about 75% of our business is related to dispensing something precisely. So that smartphone I showed you, all of the ch chips that go on the circuit board, we dispense to hold them in place. The camera modules, the microphones, the speakers, we dispense the uh, epoxy related material to hold all that in place. So when you drop it, it all doesn't fall, a fall apart and it uh, provides some good insulation. 25% is then usually in a process upstream or downstream of that dispensing activity. And at the end of the day, what we offer our customers is, is solutions. Uh, everything that we do is directing at lowering their cost of ownership. So we provide the most reliable products. We provide the most advanced technology. We usually increase their speed, which gives them more capacity, or we reduce the amount of material that they <coughs> dispense, which gives them uh, uh, a little bit more efficiency. So at the end of the day, uh, we create value for our customers. Now what we're really good at as well is getting paid for that value. And so one of the reasons we've grown uh, so much over the last uh, five years is related to continuing to create that value through that solutions approach. And then what happens is if our customer wants to do something new, they're going to come talk to us first before they talk to anyone else. Now by having the sort of best solution for our customers, uh, we've also been able to deliver some pretty uh, outstanding financial results over the last five years. So coming out of the downturn, we, we doubled the revenue of the company, uh, we tripled the profitability uh, of the company, uh, we increased the uh, margins on, of the business by about 50 percent, and, and uh, obviously as I just talked about, we increased our, our staff about 50 percent to support all of that. And it's really those 6,000 people uh, that are responsible for this outstanding performance, what they do each and every day to support our customers and create that value. Now, you know, we're a public company, so we have shareholders, uh, and our shareholders have uh, been rewarded pretty handsomely over this period of time. Uh, this is a graph that shows sort of total shareholder return. So if you, if you start here, if you come back to the left, if you started with $100 uh, in the uh, 2009 time frame, you'd have a little over $300 uh, uh, if you invested in Nordson and if you invested in everybody else, still pretty good, but somewhere between 200 and 250. So we've done a nice job for our shareholders who chose to invest in us in the downturn. So that gives you a little bit of a perspective of where we are uh, and where we've been. And now let's talk a little bit about where we're going. So everybody knows what a BHAG is? Anybody know what a BHAG is? They're not that's not a critical term they use in, the, in your finance courses? Okay. So what we're really trying to do is be very aspirational and stretch and stretch beyond uh, what we think our limits might, uh, might be. And so part of what I'll talk about here is how we go about that. And for us, uh, if you do it, uh, we want to be a three plus billion dollar company, prof very profitable company in the next five years. And if you look back in 2009, we were about an 800 million dollar company. In 2014, we were a 1.7 billion dollar company. And in 2019, we're hoping to be greater than three billion. Now you think about how we're going to do that, uh, about 60 percent of that uh, three billion dollars is going to come just from businesses uh, that we had historically and the growth and the inherent growth in those businesses which is very good. Another uh, 20 percent is going to come in what I call four new growth areas that we'll talk about in a minute but read that as companies and businesses that we've invested in in the last three years. We bought uh, 12, 13, Jim, I'm losing track here now. Uh, 12 or 13 companies in the last four years, they're going to generate another 20% of that growth. And what that means then is we're going to buy some more stuff. And so we'll talk a little bit about what we'd like to focus on and where we'd like to acquire additional businesses that would give us that, uh, that revenue. So we're constantly out there uh, looking to uh, add to our portfolio while we're growing the portfolio that we have. And one of the things I, I thought I'd do is spend a few minutes uh, to uh, cover uh, how we think about strategic planning as a way to help us deliver on this uh, on this BHAG. 
So before we start talking about what our strategic plan is, what our process is, it's kind of important to step back and say, what are we talking about when we, when we say strategy? And there's, a, there's books, so, you know, hundreds, thousands of books written uh, around strategy, but it really comes down to a few simple things. Or maybe I'm just simple and I can only un understand a few things. And, and the first one is it's all about making choices. You don't have in unlimited resources, whether that's people or capital, uh, or access to markets, they're not unlimited. So you have to make a choice on where you're going to focus your attention and then allocate your resources appropriately. So you have to make choices. You have to make choices on where you're, you're going to compete. So that could be which markets, which geographies, which businesses, which industries. And you have to make choices on how you're going to compete. And that could be your products, uh, that could be your channels uh, to market, it could be your business model, and we'll talk a little bit more about business model uh, in a minute. But it's all about making choices. And then related to that, uh, if you're making these choices, you, you better have these two things. You better have some real competitive advantage uh, because you want to grow faster than everybody else. You want to make more uh, mar margin than anybody else. And you have to be able to sustain that. So it's really important to understand that you have competitive advantages, what those are, what those are and how you're going to sustain those. And then finally, if you do that, uh, you can come through the process with a pretty clear direction on where you want to head. And again, it's about choices. And that's as much about what you're not going to do as it is about what you are going to do. Uh, so at Nordson, uh, we've, we've kind of put together a three-phased approach to this. Uh, the first part here, it says baseline development. This is really trying to understand how the businesses that we have are going to perform. So how are they going to grow? How are they going to improve profitability? What can I expect from the businesses I, I have if I pro make the appropriate choices and support those businesses? You know, the, the second piece is how do I extend uh, what I have uh, in terms of products or markets that are more closely into the core of what we do today? And this is really important for, for Nordson because we have very nice positions in each of our existing businesses and markets. So it is more challenging for us to do what they would call roll-ups, buying other qu companies in our space. So we have to go to things we call adjacencies, things that are close but not exactly in the, in the markets or businesses that we're in today. And then the third piece is to make sure that down the road, we call this our corporate growth strategy, is to make sure that we're not opportunity limited. Now, one of the good things about delivering that financial performance that I talked about before is it gives you a lot of options. Well, we have the financial wherewithal to pretty much do whatever we want. So the question is, what do we want to do? And let's not make sure that we're not limited in our choices. We have to make choices, but let's make sure we're not limited. The first phase of our process is the one I'm going to talk about here. The baseline development is really driving, how do we drive growth organically in the businesses that we already have? Now, I got a, I got a bit of an eye chart here uh, that highlights some of the tools that we use. And you can't read any of those. And that was by design. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, of what, how we think about things. So the, the first part of this is we look at every business that, that we're in and the industry it supports and look at the structure of the industry to say, okay, is it a profitable one? Now, we're doing pretty well, so we, we think we're profitable, but is it a structure where everybody makes money, an industry where everybody makes money, or are we the only ones? And uh, generally speaking, it's good if you're in a, a, an industry structure where everybody's making money. Might not be across the whole supply chain, but it might be in certain pieces. The second piece that we look at is how are the markets growing? In particular, we're interested in uh, understanding how we accelerate growth in our, in our existing businesses and if we were to acquire what markets are growing faster than the ones we're already in. You know, the third piece is what I mentioned before, what are our sustainable competitive advantages? And this is always a great debate. You know, we have to sort through the legend in your own mind syndrome where we think, you know, we've got a hundred competitive advantages and they're all, they're all sustainable and they're all strategic. And there's a lot of discussion and debate when we went through this uh, dialogue about, no kidding, what are we really good at? And we'll talk specifically later about what we think that is. And then, 
you know, we judge ourselves around uh, the you know, cost of capital concept. I'm, I'm sure you guys have uh, talked about that. But are we really, are each of the businesses or product lines, and we now have about 25 product lines, are they all earning their cost of capital or can they earn their cost of capital? And, and as such, then, are we creating economic value? And we look at that every, every year. And, uh, you know, not everything is way above the cost of capital line. So that, that gets a little additional scrutiny on what are we going to do to further improve. And this last piece, uh, continuous improvement, is a set of tools and processes that really help us figure out how we're going to improve all of our businesses. It's also something we use when we buy companies to help them improve as well. If you look at the organic focus, so after we've done all this, we understand what our core businesses can do. If you remember that pie chart I showed you, 60% of our, our, our goal to that $3 billion is going to come from growing those businesses. Uh, then a lot of that is underpinned by technology. Now, you see a lot of stuff coming up here, and you probably have no idea what this, uh, what this stuff is. Uh, but let me just say it's all highly valuable. Uh, it's all very expensive. We make great margins on it, but we do because these are elements that provide technology leadership for us. So one of the first things that we, we start with is making sure we have the best technology, which means we make a choice to allocate resources and capital to R&D. And then the other thing that we do uh, is we've put in place a process that helps us make smarter, better decisions. We call it Envision. But it's really about how you pick which things you're going to work on to improve your products, add new products. We do a lot of analytics around, the, around this to understand you know, the potential in the, in the marketplace. But at the end of the day, this is a year where we probably have 40 or 50 new products uh, coming out in the marketplace across all of our businesses. Some are incremental in nature in terms of their benefits. Some are totally new products. Some get it like this first one here we call uh, it's got this beautiful name, XM8000. It's really getting us into a whole new market segment and set of customers we don't participate with today. So that would be a way we extend our business organically. Uh, another area we're focused on is continuing to grow in emerging markets. As I said, 75% of our business is outside the US. About 40% would fall into that category of emerging markets. So developed, we would categorize as the US, Europe, and Japan. Emerging would be, you know, the traditional BRIC countries, uh, other parts of uh, Asia and Latin America. And we, we see good growth. A lot of people would die for 68% revenue growth in their developed markets. We see that as, as good growth, but 10 plus percent in emerging markets. And one of the underlying drivers of that is a growing middle class. As, as people improve uh, their income levels, they have a lot more discretionary spending. That really drives a lot of the products that we supply. So they're buying more packaged food, or they're buying smartphones, or uh, in places like China, uh, you know, they've transitioned to uh, uh, away from finally away from cloth diapers. We like that. So there's uh, there's a, a significant focus that we have on, on growing emerging markets, and probably 60% uh, of our growth going forward will come from emerging markets. The other thing that we want to do is not only grow our revenue, we want to become more profitable. If we become more profitable, that gives us more funds to invest in continuing to grow our existing businesses and to go out and acquire more businesses. So we, we have a, a concept which we call the Norton Business System, where we've put together a bunch of best practices, processes, approaches uh, that help us do everything from our workaround strategy to our work around new products, to how we look at pricing, to, to how we look at uh, segmentation, uh, to how we look at the efficiency and effectiveness of our sales force. So a lot of different aspects to it. The, the bottom line is we're trying to improve profitability further to give us even more flexibility financially. So if you, if you put all that together, our, our goal is to, to grow revenue sort of high single digits, uh, so 8 9% over a long-term basis, and then to grow our earnings faster than that. Some of that is going to come from our existing businesses. Some of that's going to come from things that we're trying to do to grow our existing businesses uh, and to add acquisitions. And then some of it, in terms of the earnings power, is going to come from that continuous improvement activity. So the first part of our process was all around, how do I get the most out of the businesses I have today? 
the second part of our process, uh, you know, we called uh, business development, is what am I going to add? And uh, one thing you might imagine is, uh, uh, given that we're growing and pretty profitable, every investment bank in the world has come in with the best, the next best great idea for us. I think at one point in time we added them up, Jim, we had 98 different pitches to us about what we could do with all the money we make. And, and so it's interesting, uh, but we really needed a structure and an approach to think about where do we really want to go? What choices do we want to make to add to our uh, portfolio? So uh, one of the first things we did is put together a bit of an overall criteria to help us sort through either whole new areas that we want to get into or specific companies that we might want to acquire. And, and the kinds of things that you would, would look at are, are around things like the, the market and competitive dynamics. So as we talked about further, is the mar are the markets growing? You know, is it one where it's very competitive and nobody's making uh, any money? Is it one where it's uh, fragmented so that if you took a position, you could make additional acquisitions and build scale and, and have uh, an even larger, more profitable business? Uh, the business, business model, when we talk about business model, there's really four things that, that are important to us. So you'll see later on in, in terms of what we think are our strategic uh, competitive advantages are one, around technology, having the best technology. It's two, what we call applications uh, know-how. And that means we understand how our, pro our customers are going to use our equipment in their processes better than they do so that we can out, go out and help them with the solution side of things. Uh, you know, three, we have uh, a global service organization that helps them install our equipment. It helps them service our equipment. We also get 40% of our revenue from spare parts. And so these service folks are also our frontline salespeople for our spare parts. Uh, and, and then we have a global, a global footprint, which gives us significant uh, advantage. You know, size we look at. Size comes into play. When you think about doing an acquisition, you could buy something that's a $5 million revenue company or a $300 million revenue company, and the work that you need to do to make that acquisition is not a lot different. Uh, so size is important. Financial performance. We generally are not looking to buy companies that, that are what we put in the category of fixer uppers. We like to buy market and technology leaders that are performing well, and we recognize we need to pay a lot for that. But that's what we're looking for. Uh, risk comes in, as I talked about earlier, we, we have some adjacencies, so we have to go outside sort of our core today. There's more risk as you go outside. And then finally today, things are really expensive, and you can't buy anything uh, without some synergy, which means you're either going to be able to grow the combined companies faster or you're going to be able to improve their profitability. So that's something we use as a guide to anything that we're looking at. Uh, to four areas that we've identified as important to us to go look for acquisitions uh, and to specific companies that we would look at. So as I said earlier, we've been, we've been busy. I think this adds up to 10 companies on the right that we have uh, bought. There's a couple others that would fa fall into that category of tucking into our existing businesses. And we had identified four areas that were important to us that were extensions of businesses we're in today. So we do a lot in adhesive processing. What does that mean? <coughs> Sealing boxes and cartons, putting labels on, on uh, bottles, things like that, putting diapers together. Uh, but there's a move to go to more plastic-based packaging. So if you go to the grocery store, you see a lot of plastic uh, pouches or a lot of uh, structurally injected molded containers. You know, your ter detergent might be in that. Your, your, long, um, your oil, you know, oil might be in that, uh, and the flexible packages are generally around food. So one, one whole area that we got involved in is that whole area of putting together a series of equipment that will allow you to make either films or to allow, to allow you to support injection molding. Uh, another area that we're interested in we call cold material uh, dispensing. It's a very sophisticated term, uh, and we, we use it to distinguish it from the top one, which is hot material dispensing. So meaning it's, it's room temperature. But it's used in a lot of different things. In the auto industry, if you look at your car, 
you know, the headliner is put in and, and glued in. The door panels are, are glued in. Your da all, everything on your dashboard is glued in. The, your headlamps are, are glued together. So we do a lot of business in, in the auto industry with that. But there's a lot of other things uh, that, that are involved. Anybody here play golf? Okay, your golf clubs are glued together. So that's an opportunity for us. Anybody uh, ride a plane lately, flying a plane lately? Okay, so there's a lot of things in the plane where you can you know, either glue something together or seal it together and we're involved uh, with that. So we want to broaden that. We've made one acquisition now. It's been a great acquisition for us. We'd like to do a lot more uh, in that space. And then one of the areas that we've gotten into is medical devices and particularly around plastic components. Uh, and this is everything from uh, things like uh, something a surgeon would use in an operator room to where they might, might use adhesives in, in lieu of stitches in an operation. So they're, they're, doing, they're, they're gluing you back together now as opposed to uh, uh, stitching you up. So, so medical components for that or in the tube sets. If you look at the tube sets that might be intravenous uh, uh, tube sets, there's a lot of components. They're actually very high tech components. They don't look like much on this screen. This stuff on the lower left looks like it's uh, pretty unsophisticated. It's very sophisticated and people pay a lot of money for it and we make high margins on it. We want to do more of that. We most recently got involved with a company that makes catheters. And then finally, we want to make sure, as I said earlier, that we're not opportunity limited. So we have gone through a whole process to look at growing the company in new ways. The starting point for that was to have a discussion around what are we really good at and you can see uh, on the slide, some of the things that I talked about on the left side of this as core competencies or true competitive advantages for us. And some of the things on the right are uh, what we'd call strategic assets. So we are global. We have a broad product line. We have tremendous customer relationships. You know, you would, you would recognize all of our, our customers, companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, Electrolux, uh, the company I can't say, you know, this company that I can't utter their name. Uh, we have a lot of strong global uh, relationships and we use that as a way to think about how do we want to go forward. And one of the things that we did, and I'll just flash this up quickly, is we tried to put our organization structure aside and look at uh, our business and capabilities today from a different perspective. So what is it that our businesses do? That's this <coughs> functional perspective. And what markets are we already uh, in? So I'll give you an example of uh, of this functional look. There's something here we call low volume dispensing. That would be what, what I described in terms of how we'd put a phone together. Something else that we've, we've, we've looked at and we have some interesting new business prospects and some business today uh, is dispensing uh, chocolate uh, in very unique and, and decorative types of uh, uh, candies and, and uh, desserts. It doesn't sound like it would be a very sophisticated kind of activity, but it is. So we, we've kind of looked from, I'm going to put your phone together, to where can I apply the same kind of approach and technology into chocolate dispensing. Uh, you know, another area is in the electronics area. We do dispensing to put all those chips on the phone, but before you put the chips on a board, the board has to be clean. So we bought some technology that cleans the board. And then we look downstream. When you put all that stuff on, they want to make sure everything's connected electronically so your phone works. We have some inspection technology there. So we've looked at it from a market and a functional perspective and a product perspective to make sure we look very wide on new opportunities and ideas. We looked in total at 150 different spaces. So this would be 150 different markets than we're in uh, today. We went through some significant analysis. We selected those down to a handful that we're going to focus on. Uh, I'd say seven that we're working on here, and the newer ones are plastics, cold materials, medical components. There's another one uh, that's in the test and inspection space. Uh, and then there's six others we're looking at, and, and something that would fall into that six other category. You've heard a lot about additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Uh, that's an area that we're uh, investigating today. You know, and the common thread in, in all of this is that we want to look for areas where we can develop a leadership position, where uh, the businesses are growing, and where we can fill in gaps in our own capability and skill set. 
So we took a hard look at what's important to us, what defines a leadership position for us, and so everything on the left we think is important to have a leadership position. Leadership position means uh, we've got scale, we've got the ability to invest, uh, and at the end of the day we can grow faster and have a higher profitability business, which gives us flexibility to continue to reinvest. <coughs> Now, if you look at places where we have gaps, many of the acquisitions that we've made in the last couple of years have filled in some of those gaps. So if you look at the medical space, we have made two more acquisitions to add to the product breadth. Uh, we are building some scale. We are going internationally with basically uh, North American-based companies. So we're trying to, uh, to use acquisitions as well as a way to fill in gaps in our capability here, again, to create that strong strategic advantage uh, that it's going to allow us to outcompete any, anybody else in the marketplace. Now, if we do that right, we always want to have a significant pipeline of uh, acquisition targets. So this is kind of a representative sample of our acquisition targets. And one of the things that you have to think about when you're making an acquisition is what level of risk are you taking? So this is a simple plot of, of market and technology or product. And if you, in the lower left, it's pretty much in the spaces we're operating today and we kind of understand the markets, we understand the technology. If you're in the upper right, it's a new market and it's a new set of products. Which one do you think has more risk? Well, the upper right has a lot more risk. Yeah, so what we want to have is a constant portfolio of opportunities because we might approach somebody and they might not want to sell or we might not be able to agree on the on the price. Uh, so these are all the things on the lower left that we're working on today across the various businesses. Uh, and the things that are, that are bigger, particularly the ones uh, in yellow, are, thing, are areas that could be potential whole new businesses for us. So I mentioned 3D printing as one area that we're looking at. That may not work out as a whole new business uh, for us uh, uh, because quite frankly, the technology they use today is not as sophisticated as we use in, in our own business. And then finally, if you think about it, it's great to have a strategic planning process. It's great to have a strategy. It's good to follow that to make the choices. But if you don't have the right people, nothing is, uh, nothing's going to work. Nothing's going to, to happen. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about one of the other key focuses uh, of our efforts, and that's around developing bench strength. If we want to double uh, again to $3 billion, we're going to have to add 50% uh, at least more people into the organization. So how are we, are, are we going to lead and manage and develop those? And so we've made talent management a, a top priority, and I'll just touch on a couple of things. We've obviously developed, we've, we've obviously put a lot of focus on this, and one of the key areas that we put in place is a formalized leadership development training program. So we've taken 150 leaders in the company and have them involved in working with uh, Harvard Business Publishing, 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 and the Harvard Business School around uh, strategy, innovation, uh, con uh, change management, and people management. And obviously, on the on the other end of the spectrum, we want to continue to refresh and renew our organization. So we're out uh, uh, partnering with uh, uh, with colleges, vocational schools. We're enhancing our recruiting activity so that we can bring additional people into our organization to support that, uh, that growth that we know we're going to need. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, we know we're not going to be financially limited. The work around strategy is to make sure we're not opportun opportunity limited. The work around talent is to make sure that we've got the right workforce and leadership to, to make sure we go there. Now, I thought we might take a second and talk to you about who we're not recruiting. And uh, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let you do this. We have a little trouble here. Gentlemen, senior midterm grades. Well, oh, they're not posted yet, sir. I see. Mr. Kruger, two C's, two D's, and an F. That's a 1.2 grade average. Congratulations, Kruger. You're at the top of the down effect class. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> 0 0.2. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life. <laughs> Mr. Hoover, president of Delta House, 1.6, four C's and an F. A fine example, you say. 
Daniel Simpson Day has no great point average. All horses can compete. Mr. Blue. <laughs> Mr. Blutarski. Zero point zero. I'm going to let you just, just push it. So how many people are uh, familiar with that scholarly work, Animal House? <laughs> let me just tell you that there are at least 11 sayings that you can use in a business setting. So maybe as a homework assignment, you can figure out what those 11 sayings are, but I've used them all. One of the things that uh, is also important to us at, uh, at Nordson, along with obviously the, the business success, the focus on strategy, the focus on people, uh, is really around giving back to the community. And we see a lot of similarities uh, here with uh, you know, John Carroll in terms of that service uh, element. And if you look at it, uh, a couple of things I've highlighted here, ethical behavior, enlightened citizenship, giving back to the communities. Uh, this past year, uh, one of the benefits of being as successful as we have been in the last five years, we've been able to take, take our foundation from uh, giving about $3 million back to the community uh, in that sort of 2009 time frame. Last year, we gave $8 million back to the uh, community. But even more importantly, we, we have uh, thousands of volunteer hours uh, from the folks in our organization we call Time and Talent to help out locally all the organizations that we support. About 70% of what we focus on is education, everything from preschool through college. But the most important thing is the, is the volunteer hours that our folks uh, put in. And Evan Nord, uh, one of the two brothers, Eric and Evan, founded the company. I cut Walter out because he was the predecessor company. And, uh, but Eric and Evan really were the driving force behind the company. You know, Evan uh, was absolutely focused on uh, giving back to the community. And, and I, I like this quote from him, to, to be truly fit, we must exercise our, uh, our giving muscles. And so I'm going to give you just a brief sense of what we do at Nordson from the uh, standpoint of giving back to the community. Since its founding, Nordson has believed it has a social responsibility to share its success. As Nordson co-founder Evan Nord once put it, to be truly fit, we should learn to exercise our giving muscles. Each year, Nordson makes significant contributions to charitable endeavors, especially those focused on education. In addition, the company operates a matching gifts program that matches employee and retiree donations to nonprofit organizations and schools. Nordson's Time and Talent Volunteer Program provides employees, retirees, and their families opportunities to participate in volunteer activities. Since the program's inception in 1993, Nordson employees have volunteered tens of thousands of hours in a wide scope of activities. Part of the giving back is the time that our employees spend in the community helping out. It's not just the money, it's their effort, it's their mentorship, it's their uh, energy that they bring to various community activities that make the community a better place, enriches their lives, but it also helps us that we want to grow and expand the community. And we're taking that around the around the globe uh, because we think that has uh, value everywhere we go. It's consistent with our DNA, our culture, and our founding fathers' values. Nordson also strives to be a clean and quiet neighbor. We are committed to meeting or exceeding all applicable environmental regulations. We also develop products that increase efficiency and reduce waste, and we seek to use resources wisely in our manufacturing processes. In addition, we encourage employees to be environmentally responsible in the workplace and at home. So just uh, kind of wrapping up here. So we've been focused, we've made choices, We've got a few priorities over the next, uh, the next five years uh, to ensure that uh, we're able to double our, our company in that period of time. Obviously, we wanted to accelerate the growth in the businesses we have. Innovation goes a long way to do that. Taking advantage of emerging markets uh, helps as well. Uh, there's always opportunity to get better. You know, one of our uh, uh, 
core values is around how we improve each and every day, and everybody in the company can help do that, so we've got a significant focus on that as well. Uh, we're looking to add more acquisitions. We've done 12. We, we'll probably have to do another 12 uh, if we really want to meet that, uh, that goal. Uh, obviously, I talked about our, our workforce, how we expand and extend that. If you think about it, if you add just 1,000 people uh, around the globe, you need probably at least 100 people to lead or manage those. So we've got an interesting challenge for ourselves uh, going forward here, but one we're focused on and we're uh, uh, working very hard to make sure that doesn't limit anything that we want to do. Uh, and then finally, giving back to the community uh, generously. One of the best parts of my job is, uh, is being head of the Nordson Foundation and uh, uh, get, having the opportunity to write all those checks, to provide all that support uh, into the community. It's, uh, it's a great feeling and we're going to continue to do that. So thank you very much. I think we'll open it up uh, questions. for a few minutes to questions. Uh, how, yes. how is the strong dollar versus the weaker foreign currencies affecting your profitability? Uh, has everybody uh, heard that? So how's the strong dollar affected uh, our profitability. Uh, so if you look at what's happened at particularly the euro, the yen, and, and uh, some of the, uh, and actually the pound have all hurt us from a translation standpoint. In other words, we make uh, revenue in those uh, regions. We have to translate it as a U.S. company back to U.S. dollars. So it's hurt our revenue. In the first quarter, it was about uh, uh, 5% uh, reduction in, in revenue. Uh, our margins are actually up year over year uh, as uh, the, you know, the quality of the business and the absolute volume uh, was up. But it's a headwind. Uh, you know, we've uh, said for every 1% revenue hit, it's probably a 2%, two, 2.5% two imp uh, impact on earnings. So it's a, it's a big headwind. You know, our focus is around what we, what we can do to drive our businesses organically and, and where we uh, can acquire. I think from a larger perspective, it, it's a minimal impact for us, about a percent. Other questions? Yes? How do you know that your uh, key acquisitions are more than just diver diversifying your portfolio? Like, how is it going to add value to your company, not just increase your total assets? Uh, so, did everybody hear that question? It was really uh, a question around a acquisitions. How do we know that they're adding value rather than just uh, uh, diversifying? Well, that's, uh, quite frankly, that's the whole point of what I would call uh, being uh, thoughtful following strategy rather than being opportunistic. Uh, and we identified certain areas that we want to be in. We identified certain properties that we're interested in. We uh, bought the properties that we're interested in. And then it's our, our duty to go in and manage those. In a lot of cases, we have a lot of more, more capability and skill sets that we can bring to those companies to improve revenue growth and to improve uh, performance. Every uh, uh, two years after the acquisition, we do what we call a make good. So we go back and relook at the whole thing. Uh, it's not doesn't mean we don't look at it for two years. But we look at it and say, okay, how, how, do, how are our assumptions? How do we do on the revenue line? How do we do on the profit line? What can we learn from that? How do we take that back into our process? Now, we have about seven people dedicated to M&A four centrally, uh, three centrally and four in, in the businesses uh, to also help ensure that we integrate properly, that we get the value out of it. You don't get everything right, and particularly as you go into things that are a little further afield, there's always something that you miss. The question then becomes what you can you do to mitigate and offset that, and so we, we put a lot of focus uh, on that. Good question. Any other questions? Yes, sir, over here. What about the tax reform? Yeah, so uh, the, the question is around tax reform, the ability to repatriate uh, earning foreign earnings. Uh, that's an issue for a lot of companies. It's not one for us. Uh, we don't main, maintain, first of all, large cash balances. Uh, but secondly, we have we're pretty balanced geographically, and we have the opportunity to. Uh, reinvest uh, in the regions, so we don't have a, a, a big issue uh, in terms of bringing things back. 
Now, we also don't have a 3% tax rate either. You know, we're, our, our all-in tax rate globally is about 30%. Uh, but we don't have stranded uh, stranded cash, and and uh, that doesn't mean we don't support uh, a more conducive tax strategy that would help industry be more competitive from the U.S. perspective, because we're we have the highest uh, tax rate of of any country in the world, uh, and we also don't follow a territorial tax system. So those are competitive advantages that we have to overcome, competitive disadvantages that we have to overcome. But we're not going we won't have a stranded cash issue. Other questions? What year did you go public? 73, was it, Jim? I think 1973. Uh, there was not, actually not, never an IPO. Uh, it's kind of a unique situation where the founders uh, uh, gave a lot of people stock, and, and eventually uh, they made a market for the stock and sold and traded it, but it was never an, IP, an official IPO. Kind of an interesting phenomenon. Other, other questions? Is there one over here? What impact has the Affordable Care Act had on your company? Yeah, the Affordable Care Act, uh, it's had, uh, I'd say, a limited impact from a uh, cost or availability standpoint. It hasn't really impacted our plans. Uh, we also don't necessarily have Cadillac plans, so uh, it, it, we haven't been impacted in that regard. Obviously, it costs, uh, uh, it, it costs more money in terms of things that we have to uh, contribute. and. It's, it hurts some of our customers, like the medical device manufacturers, who have to pay an additional tax, and that's slowed a little bit of uh, investment. But it hasn't been a huge cost uh, impact uh, you know, for us yet. So we got a question back here. Do you find that any industries have a major impact on their stock price? For example, like if Boeing and Lockheed Martin, CCC, drop in their stock price, would that affect your well, the good, the, the good news is that, we, that we operate across a lot of different industries, so uh, no one generally has a big impact. But I would say, uh, if you look at it, we've got a pretty big uh, part of our portfolio, probably 30% or so, uh, tied some, in some way, shape, or form to the electronics industry. That can, from time to time, uh, move the stock price if somebody's uh, out of favor. Uh, you know, generally, we describe uh, how we operate kind of above the markets, and what I mean above the markets, if the market's going to grow 5%, then we're going to grow at 10% because of either our focus, our products, the, the things that we're doing to create demand, but we're not immune to it. So electronics is one. And then regionally, you, you can have impact. So if you go back uh, three or four years ago coming out of the downturn, the fact that we had a lot of business in emerging markets was fantastic because the growth was higher at that point in time. Everybody loved, loved that. Well, right now, a lot of the emerging markets are struggling. Most of Latin America is a disaster. Mexico is okay, but most of South America is a, is a disaster right now. And you see struggles in, uh, in Russia, obviously, with the political situation. Uh, you see uh, struggles in China relative to where they were. They're still growing, but they're not growing at 15%. It's more like 7%. So we can see waves of concern one way or, an or another. But generally speaking, we've got, we're balanced ge uh, geographically, and we're balanced from a market standpoint, and we're balanced between uh, consumer non-durables and consumer durables. And we have about 40% of our business that's pretty steady that comes through parts and consumables, which helps. Other question, one back here. Yeah, so we, uh, the question was around uh, uh, the, what we call our time and talent program, the volunteer hours in, in, in the community, and is that after hours or is that uh, during the workday? The answer to that is yes, both. Uh, we do have a formal uh, program. It, it is called Time and Talent. Our uh, community affairs folks uh, and, head, and the uh, person that runs our foundations uh, manages that uh, for us. And, that, and we do a, a good job of focusing on what uh, charitable organizations that we're going to support and how they align with our 
uh, strategy. It could be everything from helping out someone like uh, Second Harvest packaging food, you know, once a week. But it also could be taking somebody with accounting skills and, and asking them to go on the board or them volunteering to go on the board of a charity that's, having struggle, uh, that's struggling to put a budget together. You know, so for us, uh, you know, uh, f from a high level, we, you know, we're helping out the communities we work in. But when you think about it, uh, our employees of the future are going to come from those uh, communities. So we want to do everything that we can from a very parochial standpoint to support that. That's why about 70% of what we do is around uh, education. And we do a lot of, uh, around uh, STEM education uh, as well. And we start from preschool uh, through college. So uh, I think the payback for, uh, for us, uh, besides the great feeling we have in supporting the community, is really helping that community uh, improve and being a source of, of great employees for us going forward. <coughs> Question back here. Uh, yes, uh, Valley and I just came out with an uh, analysis on Nordson in uh, April 17th, and they're reflecting a uh, annual total growth of uh, two and a half percent uh, for 2015 to You mentioned uh, doubling in five years, it looks like maybe 15 percent. Is there something in the difference that they were not aware of? Well, I'm not, I'm, I didn't quite catch your time frame. It was a question around value line uh, assessment or analysis of Nordson. Uh, 2018, 2020. Right. Uh, so I think in the short term, uh, the question that was asked first around the currency impact is, uh, uh, is something that are skewing some people's thoughts around the, the you know, future of the company. Uh, you know, so uh, as I said, uh, in the first quarter, we, we grew organically. Uh, Eight nine percent, uh, but the actual revenue growth was about that's from a volume perspective was around three or four percent. If you exclude acquisitions, it was around ten percent with acquisitions. It's that currency effect that's had an impact in the short term. What I'm what I'm telling you here is if we were at uh, currency neutral from from going forward here, we expect uh, high single digit kind of growth, so eight nine percent kind of growth. But I think currency is coloring everything today. Every uh, and we're in the middle of earnings season, so every announcement that comes out, people are talking about currency, the impact of uh, currency. Uh, it's not affected competitiveness now. It's not affected our view of long-term growth rates. Quite frankly, our, our organic uh, volume growth to date has been really good, so we're encouraged. Other questions? I think if we have one more. Okay, we got one over here. Uh, how do you decide how to output your free cash flow between uh, dividends yeah, it's a very good question. The question is around the allocation of capital and how we decide that. Uh, we've got a pr pretty clear set of uh, priorities. So the first priority is support our existing business. We need about 3% of our revenue to support growth in our existing business. That's relatively light because we're an asset light business. Our second priority is to continue uh, increasing dividends uh, each year and to be in a 20 to 25 percent payout range. We're in that range now, but we've got 50, 51 years of continuous increase in dividends. We want to do that. Uh, the third uh, priority, quite frankly, is around uh, uh, eliminating dilution. So we have a number of our compensation programs across the company that involve some kind of share-based compensation, and so we want to offset that dilution would become from issuing shares. That's re relatively modest in the grand, the grand scheme of things. If you look at our EBITDA last year, it was about over 400 million. Those first three things that I, I talked about probably get you to 100, 120 million, something like that. After that, our priority would be acquisitions, if we can find the right uh, acquisitions. Uh, we have a, a nice pipeline, but you never can control the timing or your degree of success. Uh, and then we do always want to have an open uh, share repurchase program. Uh, the market has been volatile over the last three years. We've been able to buy shares back opportunistically at very attractive prices, on average 30% discounts to where we are today. That's a pretty good investment, too. So that's sort of the, the, the priority of uh, cash utilization. and. You know, as part of our strategic plan, we put a finance plan associated with that. So we'll get to that capital allocation, but it'll also get to how much debt, what kind of debt, short-term, long-term, fixed, variable. You know, what do we need today? What do we need to have uh, some powder dry if we want to make a bigger acquisition? So that's all linked to our strategic plan. OK? 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your attention.